this first session, I'm going to, as a dermatologist, obviously focus on dermatology, and then David will speak uh, following me uh, with more of a focus on, on surgery and staging. Um, so uh, I'm going to cover uh, what you need to know about skin checks and what you should expect when you go and see your GP or your dermatologist for a skin check and uh, what to expect during your surveillance checks, um, how we actually diagnose melanoma. Um, and then I'll touch a little bit on wound and scar management. Um, and then I'll talk about referrals and, and multidisciplinary care. Um, we'll talk a little bit, bit about the impact of COVID as well, although perhaps a lot of you are sick of hearing too much about it. So I think um, everybody uh, on this webinar can understand the challenge of melanoma. Uh, it is unfortunately Australia's cancer. It is uh, a big issue for us here in Australia. Unfortunately, we lead the world in our incidence rates of melanoma. Uh, and here it's the third most common cancer for um, men after prostate and bowel and for women after breast and bowel. Um, and that's actually invasive cases of melanoma. But if we count in situ cases of melanoma, then it's certainly the most common cancer in Australia. Uh, it's the most common cancer in young people. So it does affect young people and it gets more common uh, with age. So certainly increasing age is a risk factor because we accumulate a lot of uh, UV damage over our lifetimes. Um, it's a costly cancer to the health system um, uh, and oftentimes because of the uh, number of um, biopsies that we take as a just in case to make sure that we're not missing anything. Um, so, so that's an issue as well. Uh, it costs skin cancer in general, so that's basal and squamous cell cancers, uh, as well as melanoma costs the health system about well, close to a billion dollars per annum. Uh, and melanoma is a fraction of that. Um, there's no uh, population-based screening program uh, in Australia. Uh, and th that's really because that there's no evidence um, that a population-based screening program will really reduce uh, melanoma mortality. Um, just because there's a lack of evidence doesn't mean um, that there isn't benefit from a more targeted screening program. And so there is a lot of evidence, um, a lot of uh, um, input at the moment into trying to develop something that is a little bit more targeted and will be effective. Because at the moment we have um, screening, our screening is opportunistic. So when you see the GP is often an opportunity to, to do a skin check at the moment. Um, but um, there's nothing that is like the um, breast or, or bowel uh, cancer screening programs. Um, so surveillance strategies and frequency of visits really does vary between practitioners and the advice varies uh, and diagnostic accuracy varies as well. So you can imagine if you see someone who's experienced and seeing a lot of melanomas every day, then their accuracy will be quite good. And if you see someone who is not so um, uh, experienced in, in treating melanoma, then um, they may take a number of biopsies um, for any one melanoma that is, is diagnosed. So who detects melanoma? Well, actually most melanomas are self-detected. So that's why it's really important to understand what's on your skin, to know what's on your skin, um, to check it yourself at home and take note if there are any new lesions or any changing lesions. Um, 10 to 15% of melanomas are actually diagnosed by uh, your partner or significant other. Wives are quite likely to detect, and often we hear that, that my wife wanted me to come in and get it checked. Um, and only 15 to 20% are actually detected by doctors during a routine skin examination as an incidental finding. Although when they are detected in that way, they tend to be thinner. So who should be having a regular skin check and how often? Well. Um, we get asked this a lot and it really depends on the individual's level of risk. So if you're low risk, then it is quite safe and acceptable to be checking your skin at home. And we suggest that you check your skin at the change of each season. Um, if you are slightly higher risk, uh, it is good to have those opportunistic checks if you're going to the GP for other reasons or booking in specifically to have your skin checked. 
Um, if you're higher risk, we do suggest um, more frequent surveillance. And if you're ultra high risk, and we'll go into what that means, then it is a good idea to see uh, a dermatologist for surveillance. Um, you may, it may be a good idea to have photography and we'll discuss um, why that might be useful um, and uh, check slightly more frequently. And particularly if you've got a lot of moles, if you've got other risk factors. So what are the risk factors? Who's at high risk? Um, well, there are a number of uh, risk factors listed there. And certainly if you've had a history of melanoma, you're at an increased risk of developing a second melanoma. You've essentially proven that you can grow them. Uh, you may uh, get a, a second or third in your lifetime. So if you've had a past history of one, you have approximately 10% risk of getting another. And if you've got a lot of other risk factors, you may have 10 to 20% risk of, of having another melanoma. Um, having a large number of moles is certainly a strong risk factor. And there are the larger moles that you can see in this example here, which are called dysplastic moles. Uh, and they increase your risk as well. We don't recommend routine uh, excision of, of dysplastic moles or moles as a just-in-case strategy because removing those uh, really doesn't reduce your risk. Most melanomas actually arise as a completely new lesion rather than a change in a pre-existing mole. So there are a number of algorithms that you can use to work out your own risk. Um, we developed a, a, a risk calculator, uh, which is available on our website. There's also one that was developed uh, by the Queensland group and a more recent one on the Melanoma Institute website, all available. So you can have a look at those and, and look at your own risk. And that's an important thing uh, to know. So when we think about melanomas, there are certainly different subtypes. And you will have heard uh, probably about uh, some of the different subtypes. The most common by far is, is a superficial spreading melanoma. Um, and that usually occurs um, on, on the trunk in men, on the lower leg in, in women. Uh, and it is um, associated with people with a number of moles. Um, Lentigo malignant melanomas are, are common on the head and neck and aquilentigenous melanoma on the feet. And they're all examples of what we call radial growth phase melanomas. So they tend to grow along the epidermis, which is the superficial layer of the skin uh, for some time, usually uh, months before they start to invade and become uh, more concerning. And then there are vertical growth phase tumours. And they tend to sometimes skip this radial growth phase of being confined to the epidermis only and can invade more rapidly into the, into the dermis and the deeper layers. And they are nodular melanomas and desmoplastic melanomas typically. So I explain that just because it, it does point to some of the challenges that we have for screening and early diagnosis. So you can imagine that the growth, uh, the growth rate of the melanoma is important in how easily we might be able to detect it at an early stage. So those vertical growth stage tumours actually have a very narrow window of opportunity to detect when they're still thin. And nodular melanomas we've shown have uh, have an increased uh, growth rate um, being uh, a vertical growth before that um, as, a, as a first uh, pattern of growth rather than that more prolonged radial growth phase to start with, which is what we see usually with superficial spreading. The other challenge that we have is diagnostic accuracy and some melanomas can present in quite an atypical sort of uh, way. And this can lead to either um, uh, patients not realising that it's something that could be a melanoma because it just doesn't look like, you know, the pictures that you would see, or doctor delay because doctors don't recognise that it is something that needs more urgent attention. So what should you expect when you go for a skin check? Um, and really 
because of the features that I've just discussed, the history is really important. So if it's something that you've noticed that is growing and changing, usually over a period of about a month, then that's something that you should be getting checked. And your doctor should take notice that it's something that you're concerned about because it's new or because it's changing. You should expect to have a full skin examination. So that means that really you need to expose all of the skin down to your underwear so that we can examine um, all of the skin surface. Usually we'd start um, from, uh, from the top and work down. So go through uh, the scalp, um, look at all of the skin, including between the toes um, and make sure that we've seen everything. If there's something that you feel your doctor hasn't seen, it's a good idea to stop them and say, did you check this area? It's always fine to do that. And we encourage you to. Um, usually when we're doing a skin examination, we will use dermoscopy, which is a light. And you can see it in the photo there of my colleagues using a dermoscope to check a mole. And that just um, magnifies the lesion and lets us see some of the structures um, within the skin. And really we're looking for certain patterns that make us think that it is either a sinister lesion that needs further attention or that it's, that it's benign. Uh, if you've had melanoma, if you've had invasive melanoma, you should expect to have your lymph nodes felt. Make sure that there's nothing of concern and to check the scars and make sure there's no evidence of any pigmentation coming back around the scar or any lumps under the skin in that area as well. So we look, as I say, with a dermoscope for certain patterns that we see, and we go, go by the A, B, C, D, E rule for a majority of melanomas. And you can see that in these lesions, there's some asymmetry, there's some border irregularity, color variation, and some, but not all, have a larger diameter. So we can be fooled. Sometimes melanomas can be small and we like to catch them when they're small. Um, and the E for evolving is important. So anything that's changing and growing. But of course there are difficult cases. So these are the ones that can fool us. There's the ugly ducklings which stand out and that's, that makes things easier. Um, but there are other lesions that can mimic certainly other benign conditions and can look just atypical for what we might consider to be a usual melanoma. Um, lesions in the scalp can be particularly difficult and if they lack colour, um, they can be particularly difficult as well. So that's where the history is really important. Uh, Aquilentigenous melanomas can certainly mimic other more benign conditions like warts and so on and you can see uh, why that could be confusing. They can all also be mistaken for pressure sores uh, and nail changes can be uh, mistaken as well for other benign conditions of the nail. So it's not always easy. Sometimes when we're doing a skin check, we will find something that is concerning and so we'll recommend a biopsy. And if it's something that we're concerned is a melanoma, the usual practice is to excise it uh, with, a, with a narrow margin to start with to, to make a diagnosis. And depending on the site, we might, it not, might not be possible to remove the entire lesion, particularly if it's a big lesion or if it's a, in a cosmetically sensitive area or difficult area like the nail or the, or the, or the foot to biopsy. And so punch biopsies are occasionally used and shave biopsies might be used for particularly in situ lesions, uh, for instance, lentigra maligna on the face. So how do we care for our wounds? Um, well, it's really important to take care of yourself. Um, so no uh, going out for uh, a lot of exercise after you've had your surgery. Uh, it's best not to try to be too active or run a marathon Im immediately afterwards. Um, best to, to elevate um, uh, the limb if you can. So if it's on your leg, uh, you can put your feet up. Um, you have the night off, no dishes. Um, rest and, and get uh, some help, ask for some help around the house. Um, 
After removal of sutures, it's important to know that the scar will not be as strong as normal skin. So you still need to be a little bit careful of it. So yeah, particularly if it's on your back or somewhere that's, that stretches easily when you're bending over and so on, you just need to be a little bit careful that you're not putting too much tension on the wound. Scars will mature over months and usually improve with appearance over a number of months. And so really um, time is uh, your, your friend uh, when it comes to maturing of the scar and so on. And sometimes we'll recommend covering the scar over with micropore tape, which is like a paper tape um, that just helps with the scar maturing um, and uh, covers it nicely as well. Some areas are particularly prone to hypertrophic scars or keloid scars uh, and some people are a little bit more prone, some skin types are a little bit more prone to these. And hypertrophic scars are really just slightly raised scars with keloid scars where the a scar grows beyond um, uh, beyond the scar itself and can, can be a little bit more difficult. And there are tricks that we have for these, but the most important thing uh, is to have your melanoma removed um, and take care of that. And then down the track, uh, after um, giving it some time, uh, we can discuss uh, how to improve the appearance if that's an issue for you. Um, there are other things that we can use that don't um, uh, uh, necessarily um, require biopsy to look into, this, into the skin, into the layers of the skin. We do sometimes use confocal microscopy just to map lesions, usually after a diagnostic biopsy has been taken, but sometimes to reassure us with the appearance um, of something, particularly in a cosmetically sensitive uh, area, that it doesn't require a biopsy. Um, and this is an adjunct to demoscopy, but it isn't um, widely available. It's really something that's available in the tertiary setting. So should I have photographs? Well, there are different um, photographs that are available. And so it's important to understand what we, what we mean when we say photographs. There's total body photography, which essentially takes an image of all of the skin surface. And then there is sequential demoscopy where we take close up images of individual moles. And that's usually done to monitor them over, the time, over time and look for very subtle changes. And that can be really helpful, particularly if you've got a lot of moles um, to check and it's difficult to know if there's any subtle changes. So that usually is very helpful in picking up things early. The difficulty is that photography for melanoma surveillance is not covered by Medicare at this um, point in time, and they can be expensive. So um, there are a few research gaps um, uh, to try to, uh, uh, to um, that need to be looked into in order to address this. Um, there was a uh, submission to the Medical Services Advisory Committee um, to suggest that melanoma surveillance photography should be put onto Medicare so that our patients are reimbursed. Um, and this has um, not been approved uh, pending further evidence. Um, so we'll have a trial underway, which I'll explain in a moment, that um, will help provide the evidence um, to MSAC of the benefits of, of melanoma surveillance photography. Um, so we've got a really good opportunity to provide that uh, evidence. This is a trial um, of melanoma surveillance photography to improve early detection of melanoma in uh, high-risk patients. Um, and that will be run by the Melanoma and Skin Cancer Trials Group and will be opening soon. Unfortunately, we've been hampered a little bit with, um, with COVID, um, but that will soon be, so, soon be open. And if you're interested, you can check out the Melanoma and Skin Cancer Web, uh, trials group website. The other opportunity that we have is um, uh, a really exciting initiative um, that is funded by the Australian Cancer Research Foundation. And this is to um, develop the Australian Centre of Excellence for Melanoma Imaging and Diagnosis. And this is a big collaborative effort with colleagues um, from the University of Queensland and the University of Sydney to roll out um, 3D imaging infrastructure across the three states that will enable us to 
um, do these types of research projects and improve early detection and diagnosis of melanoma. So the, the team members um, are uh, many and varied. We've got a, a lot of different backgrounds uh, in the team. And essentially we're wanting to um, implement these imaging systems in the metropolitan centres, but also in some of the regional centres so that our regional patients can take advantage of this. And telehealth is, is uh, taking off really with, um, uh, with the COVID situation and people are using that a lot more. It is difficult though to do a skin check via telehealth and some of you might have had that experience. Um, and so this is an initiative that might help to remedy that as well. Um, and essentially the infrastructure of these uh, Vectra uh, 3D imaging machines that have 92 cameras around them um, they can take uh, the images and then stitch them together in a 3D avatar. Uh, and then we get extremely good high resolution of individual moles uh, and indeed quite close up uh, into uh, different lesions. Um, and then you can compare the body map um, side by side to look for changes. And the body map, the computer uh, the software that comes with this system will also uh, virtually remove all of the moles and put them in a chart for you and you can arrange them uh, from different sizes to different colours uh, and then have a look at all the different outliers and see if there are any that, that are concerning at all. And then you can uh, have a look at images side by side if they're taken say six months apart or 12 months apart and there will be some software that will be able to de detect uh, changes as well so that that can help us uh, detect if there is anything that we should be paying more attention to. So I think it's really exciting technology. Um, it will help us in the future and um, so watch out for the ASMID project as it as it goes live next year. So it brings us to whether or not we can in, in fact have software um, help us to actually diagnose melanomas and to date there have been a number of efforts put towards this uh, and there are some systems that are becoming available uh, to help us with our diagnos diagnosis um, using artificial intelligence. There was a paper that was published in the journal Nature in 2017, which put everybody into a bit of a spin, particularly dermatologists, because it said that essentially a computer was as good as us at diagnosing lesions. And so this is actually really exciting because um, it shows us uh, that at least in, in test conditions, that the computer is actually getting it right a lot of the time. Um, and you can see there, the blue line is, is the accuracy of the computer and you can see the little red dots are all board certified dermatologists in the US. Um, and, the, and the sensitivity and specificity of the diagnoses is actually, is actually pretty spectacular. So it's really exciting work. There is a lot of work going on to this from many different, into this from many different groups. And I think it's a matter of time before um, artificial intelligence for diagnosis is, is integrated into what we do. Um, there's been a flurry of papers since that initial publication. Um, and we're really excited to be contributing in that field as well. There are a few things that are uh, difficult about um, the way AI has been developed to date. So um, many uh, uh, data sets that include lots of different moles are very varied with only a couple of lesions from one patient. Some of them will have histological confirmation, so pathology confirmation and others won't. Um, so with the ASMID project, with the infrastructure that we'll have, we'll be able to really have a look at all of uh, the moles from any individual. And it will be much more representative. And we're hoping that that will improve the accuracy again to the next level to be able to integrate artificial intelligence into our diagnostics and improve early detection for all of our patients. 
we are looking <clears throat> at integrating this into the clinic, this sort of technology into the clinic already. Uh, and we've been running a trial with the um, Melanoma and Skin Cancer Trials Group um, called Smarty, uh, which is um, use of artificial intelligence algorithm that was developed uh, by Monash University um, and together with MolMap, uh, the company to um, integrate uh, the artificial intelligence system into uh, an imaging device, a camera that we can use in the, in the clinic very easily. And so this um, trial is currently recruiting. Uh, we're about halfway through and I think we've got some really exciting results that we'll be able to share um, hopefully next year with you. So having had a melanoma diagnosed, um, who, who really should you be seeing? So um, certainly if you have any complex melanomas, if you have a thick melanoma uh, or an intermediate thickness melanoma, uh, really it's a good idea to discuss with your doctor being referred to a multidisciplinary team. A lot of uh, in situ melanomas and thinner melanomas can be very safely managed in the community. And we're always here to support GPs and um, community doctors to, to be able to do this. Um, but if your situation is more complex, I think being uh, managed in a multidisciplinary team setting uh, is um, a good idea. We do um, uh, manage um, patients together where we, you, know, you can see a photo of us there having a discussion uh, about each of our patients. We have oncologists, surgeons, radiation oncologists in the room, dermatologists. Um, and our, care, and, and our um, clinic coordinators, and uh, we can really uh, organise the pathway that best suits the individual. Um, we also are tied in, and this goes for all the tertiary centres that have melanoma units, usually very well tied in with research and clinical trials. Um, and so really that those uh, opportunities to be involved in research and trials, uh, if you're interested, um, uh, I think are important. And the research and the trials that we do directly impacts the way that we care for our patients um, and the opportunities that patients will have in years to come. Is it safe to see my doctor at the moment? Well, um, it is, we may look a little bit different. Um, there's some really good uh, advice uh, and support that the MPA have put together uh, for patients that's available on their website. Um, this is our clinic coordinator, Marissa Fielding, calls from our doctors who are, who are working offsite doing telehealth. So some of us are working offsite, some of us are working on site, and we're always there to see you face to face, obviously, if, that, um, if that's um, what needs to happen. We obviously try to keep people at home where we can and where it's safe to do that and offer a telehealth consult. And that's particularly uh, useful if we're uh, talking about results, um, but oftentimes if we're planning surgery and so on, it's, it's best to see you um, face to face and it is safe to do that. So um, with that, I'll leave uh, with a, a final slide. Um, just to make you aware about a survey that we have uh, worked on uh, together with MPA and, um, and a number of other groups uh, looking at improving melanoma and skin cancer awareness in regional and rural Australia. Uh, it will be available soon and, and may be coming to you via MPA and I encourage you to have your say and let us know if there are any uh, experiences um, uh, that you would like to share and any information that you feel uh, you need um, or could be delivered uh, uh, in a better way to you. Um, so looking forward to, to hearing from you. Thanks everybody for your uh, attention. <laughs>